Well, good evening. Welcome to our EDS Awareness Educational Series webinar. My name is John Furman. Before we introduce our speaker this evening, we'd like to give an overview of our free program for those attending for the first time. So we will discuss who we are, what is our program, our newest program that we're very excited about, introduce our speaker, and we will not have Q&A this evening. Again, my name is John Furman. I manage the National EDS Awareness and Chronic Pain Partners nonprofit organization based in Cincinnati, Ohio. My daughter, Deanna, who is also on the call, leads the Cleveland, Ohio EDS support group. She was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS in 2008 the same year my wife Carol passed away from breast cancer. I was a caregiver for my wife who struggled with undiagnosed EDS for over 30 years. So we introduced our program at the 2012 uh, EDMF conference to help EDSers form independent local support groups and spread EDS awareness in their communities. We have been a sponsor for these conferences for the last six years, and we've started over 100 support groups to date. Each group has given their own free website with a link from the directory and map. We receive feedback that conferences provide valuable information and social opportunities, but many cannot afford physically or financially to attend in person. So we decided to bring the speakers to you through the free EDS Awareness Educational Series. We typically meet each month at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. All of the programs are free, the meeting announcements, and whenever possible, the webinar recordings will be posted on our site at edsawareness.com or chronicpainpartners.com for later replay. You can receive email announcements for future sessions by requesting the free guide on our site. Tonight's presentation is sponsored by Body Support, where you'll find over 250 products selected by EDSers for EDSers. Proceeds from this store and the donations to our nonprofit organization help fund our programs. Please visit our store and check out the helpful products that we offer. So just a general disclaimer, this presentation contains general information about EDS. Members of the EDS community voluntarily participate in the program. The information is not advice. If you're having medical problems now, please call 911 or the emergency services in your location. Always consult your doctor before making any changes to your treatment. Our Physician CME Educational Program was launched in September 2017. It provides free continuing education credits. Physicians need to renew their licenses. is the first online EDS course providing CME credit, which covers diagnosis, classification, and treatment of Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and associated conditions. Any healthcare providers interested in learning more about EDS are encouraged to view the presentations whether or not they desire the CMEs. And as a patient, you can have the opportunity to make a difference and improve awareness and understanding of EDS by encouraging your physician and other healthcare providers to participate. You may provide them with the website address, ehlers-danlos-cme.org, and also print brochures available on the CME site. So if you go to the site and uh, look at the top menu and click brochure, which is the button all the way on the right, there you can download or print them yourself. There's also an option to order multiple color copies through our Vistaprint link and get 20% off if you're uh, looking to print large quantities. Um, you can watch the webinar on our EDS Awareness site for more details about this new program. 
And uh, as always, to view our upcoming speakers, please visit the webinar page at edsawareness.com for the full schedule. Um, you can also sign up for the email list to receive uh, monthly announcements for future presenters. And our speaker tonight is Dr. Bolognese, and he's going to talk about Chiari malformation, EDS, and craniocervical instability. Dr. Bolognese is the surgical director at the Chiari Neurosurgical Center at NSPC in Lake Success, New York. And he attended the medical school at the University of Turin, and he had his residency in neurosurgery at the medical school also at the University of Turin, and also at uh, Sunny Health Science Center in Brooklyn. Um, in addition there, he uh, had his fellowship in the management of Chiari-1 malformation and related disorders. And Dr. Bolognese is the co-founder of the Chiari Center. In 2014, he started the Chiari Neurosurgical Center, where he later was joined by Dr. Kula. Uh, Dr. Bolognese is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Syringomyelia and Chiari Alliance Project, uh, also called ASAP. He's a member of the Scientific Educational Advisory Board on the CSF Foundation. And um, if you'd like to have more information, you can go to the website provided, chiariinsc.com. So it's my great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Bolognese here with us tonight, and I want to extend him a very warm welcome and thank him for uh, sharing his time and expertise with us. And Dr. Bolognese, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the microphone to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in such a good company. Uh, I took a decision uh, earlier on this month that instead of having a mix presentation and uh, questions, given the quantity, the sheer quantity of material we had to discuss, I was going to get all the uh, all the time allocated for the presentation itself. Um, let me just go here. Yes, there is for non-clinical scientific questions. And then this slide is going to be, again, flashed at the end. You can email me at uh, the email which is present, which is shown over here. Uh, as per medical legal constraints, personal legal questions will only be answered within the frame of a formal consultation. Uh, curbside emails regarding uh, personal questions cannot, can no longer be uh, allowed in the United States. An alternative to office visits for people who live far away, we do offer video consultations, which are reasonably priced considering the going standards. And our website has already been uh, given before. It has a big section of educational video within it. Um, about my experience, I've been deal with, dealing with Chiari one malformation, syringomyelia, Chiari uh, cranial cervical instability, mainly due to EDS and core for the last 20 years. I treated several thousand patients from 63 different countries and all the 50 states of the Union. Uh, my practice is about 80% adults and 20% pediatric. Um, in um, my career, I performed 1,300 Chiari surgeries, which is so far only second in the world to uh, the uh, case series of Dr. Liu in Beijing and more than 750 third course surgeries. Regarding craniocervical instability, I performed 700 craniocervical fusions, more than 400 with a classical configuration, more than 250 with a condylar screw fixation and new technique. Why we're going to talk about Chiari and EDS and why uh, they are so, uh, they're so worth of being analyzed in such a depth because both of them are prone to delayed diagnosis, as you well know from the history of your EDS. And both of them are often misunderstood by the average physician. Uh, so the vast majority of you uh, spend their, most of their medical life in a barren, and then finally they find that guy who finally gets it for the EDS. Multiply it for two diseases, and you're going to meet the life of the people with Chiari and EDS. In association to 
these problems, uh, their association, the, the clinical presentation of two of them together raises some specific diagnostic and therapeutic issues. And since there is a lot of confusion about them, that's why I'm going to take so much time to talk about it. History. The Chiari was first described by an um, Austrian pathologist called Hans Chiari in 1891. He was the pathologist at the University of Prague. EDS, on the other end, has a more complex history. It was far first described, obviously not with the name EDS, by Hippocrates, who was a um, Greek physician, at least the closest thing to a physician that they had back then. Then first was actually described by a Russian in the modern era in 1892. His name was Alexander Nikolaevich Chernoglov. And then only 10 years later was Dr. Ehlers, who was not British, but was from Denmark. And then, surprise, surprise, uh, every time we pronounce it Ehlers Danlos, we uh, commit a uh, distortion of the name of the poor Dr. Danlo, because Dr. Danlo was French. He was a physician in Paris and described in 1908. The Chiari EDS Association was first described by myself and my mentor, Dr. Mirorat, in a landmark uh, paper in 2006. Um, I want to give you some history uh, in order to understand how things go in science. The first time that I stumbled on this association was in 2002 during office visits. And immediately I went uh, after a strike of about six patients with Chiari and EDS over the course of less than two weeks, I stepped in the office of my uh, senior partner and I told them maybe we're on to something. The first reaction, skepticism. Two weeks later, he was no longer skeptic because at that point the patients had become 12. So uh, a few months later, we put together, I put together a pilot study for his review with 85 cases. And this pilot study had all the kernel of information which ended up being in the seminar article we published three years later. At that point, with the data of that article, of those 85 pilot cases, we called uh, Marcy Spear. Marcy Spear, who's now deceased because of cancer, she was the chief of genetics at the University of Duke, and she was uh, the chief person, uh, the main, main person in the world for the genetics of uh, Chiari. So, we told her what we were, um, were dealing with, and uh, she reviewed our data, and she said, You're, this is not a random thing. This is a real thing. Therefore, you're going to have to investigate. So shortly afterwards, we realized we did not know too much about EDS other than things we remember from medical school. So we called NIH, and we reached the Department of the Institute of Aging with Dr. Franco Mann and Dr. McDonald were at the, at the point. Dr. Franco Mann was the lead um, investigator of the Institute of Aging. And all of a sudden, something strange happened. We were finishing each other's sentences because we had stumbled on these strange patients with these strange symptoms which did not fit from their standpoint, from their corner, the EDS, classic EDS patient, that did not fit from our corner, the classic Chiari patient, and all of a sudden we were completing each other's sentences and finding the missing pieces of each other's puzzle. So we worked hard uh, for the following years, and we announced our preliminary uh, findings at the simulcast uh, conference, um, which went contained the simulcast at uh, IOSC in Los Angeles, especially at the National Academy Conference and National EDS Conference, which happened to be on the same day. Um, one year later, we published our findings on an article on a major neurosurgical journal. In 2010, Dr. Brockmeyer from the University of Utah, after an initial skepticism of many of our Chiari expert colleagues, uh, embraced the same, uh, the same things we were saying and incorporated in a larger concept we're going to describe later called complex Chiari. CM1 is Chiari 1 malformation, the abbreviation, and CCI is cranial cervical instability. In 2014, uh, a bunch of uh, other doctors, after seeing and not being able to unsee the association anymore, um, reached a, a consensus about the 
combination of these two disorders and what to do diagnostic and therapeutically at the CSF meeting in, uh, I think it was New Orleans. In 2015, we had uh, news from Duke University, from the group that was formerly led by Dr. Spear, that there were, there were hints of a genetic confirmation of this association. And then in 2017, extensive um, information were presented at the 29th ASAP conference about Chiari-related disorders. Uh, this was the largest conference about Chiari malformation ever done in history, with 70 speakers from four continents. At the same meeting, we submitted a questionnaire, and 63 leading international experts in the field of Chiari answered. 75.7% uh, agreed from their experience that the Chiari EDS association was real. And 96.5% agreed about the concept of complex Chiari, which also incorporates other uh, non EDS related pathologies. So, what's the bottom line? To give you an idea about what goes on in science, science does not have a, a linear behavior. It goes in acceleration, stops, acceleration, stops, some steps backwards, some steps forwards. So it took 12 years from the time that we published, and not from the time we first noticed, but from the time we first published, it took 12 years to convince many, the majority of the experts in our field, and what I mean in the experts, I mean the leading experts in the field. You know, there are about 100 people who, in the world who are the top guns in the field of Chiari. There are many people who are, have expertise, but they're not the top. So to convince 77, almost 78% of them, it took 12 years. It's going to take 12 more years to reach the other regular neurosurgeons to convince them about this. It is going to take 12 more years for the primary care physicians. So this is going to the, the estimate of what you're going to deal with. What is carry one malformation? The cause is a small posterior fossa. The small posterior fossa is the box of bone uh, of your skull, which contains the cerebellum and the brainstem. I'm going to see some pictures in a, in a little bit. So the cause is the small posterior fossa. The effect is the herniation of the cerebellar tonsils. The cerebellar tonsils are the most inferior part of the cerebellum. Now, years ago, some radiologists came out with something which is called the 5 millimeter rule. And he stated that anything which is sticking out to the skull 5 millimeter or more should be called carry one malformation, and anything less should be called something else but not carry one malformation. Now, um, our group started back in the 90s saying that these, calling BS on this rule because it was flawed and uh, was not having clinical validity. Again, we were alone back in 98, 99, and now, in 2017, 88.5% of those top gun experts in the field of Chiari agree that the 5 millimeter rule is no longer valid. That doesn't mean that uh, the rest of the neurosurgeons will even know about this controversy. They would, this is the way they, they heard, and this is the way they're going to live by until somebody is going to tell them otherwise. Other point for which the 5 millimeter rule is flawed. If you notice the first two lines, the small posterior fossa is the cause and the herniation is the effect. The point is that you can have herniation of the tonsils also for other reasons. The tonsils can be sucked from below, can be pushed from above like a tumor or hydrocephalus, so that doesn't make it a chiari, it makes it a tonsil herniation of other cause. So for all the stand, you know, things involved is a pseudo chiari. This is a picture in generic, so you see down here, if you see the cursor, this is the posterior fossa, which contains the cerebellum and the brainstem. The brainstem then continues down in the spinal cord, and then upwards expands in all the rest of the brain, so the brainstem is a bottleneck. And this is a detail showing that tonsils, which are this triangular part here, they're radiating outside of the skull, and the skull is ending between this point here is called the opistian, and this point here called the basian, which are the anterior and the posterior lip of a circular hole at the, hole at the base of the skull. So, 
let's go deeper. What is scary one malformation on a deeper level? It's a mesenchymal disorder. Mesenchyma is an embryonic connective tissue. So the mesenchyma is the father of the connective tissue. So we understand immediately that Chiari and EDS are cousins because they're coming from the same defective ancestor. Chiari is congenital, like EDS, and it crystallizes at ages 18 to 21. When I mean, what I mean for crystallizes means when we go back to the picture here, uh, once you are the picture you're going to have for this patient A, a X, Y, Z, is going to, that's not going to look the same when the patient is 10 or the patient is 18. But then after age 18, is no longer going to change. Sometimes, you know, some late growers is going to be 21. Sometimes in advance in families. So not only is congenital, so you're born with it, but it's also inheritable. So what's the difference? EDS is inheritable, uh, you know, and you, you pass it in generations. Chiari is inheritable just in a fraction of the people who have it. What is prevalence? EDS, we already know, is a much higher number, but out of 250 million of Americans, 2.5 have Chiari 1 malformation. And this number is not written in stone. Why? Because these are the 2.5 million of Americans we know about. Why? Because Chiari can also be asymptomatic. So it appears that the people who are um, who have the disorder and go to the doctor and get the MRI are the tip of the iceberg, and we do not know how big is the poor part of the people who are uh, who are asymptomatic. But we know they do exist because we find them very often among family members in the familial uh, groups of it. It can cause ringomyelia in about 50% of the cases. Ringomyelia is a fluid bubble growing inside the spinal cord. This is not going to be the topic of our conversation. Chiari 1 malformation per se has a number of comorbidities. Comorbidities are partners in crime. They're not the main dish on the table, but like the carrots, like the potatoes, have a role in it. Um, they're all in in the entire picture, sometimes by enhancing or complicating the clinical presentation of the Chiari itself. Now, when you put together Chiari and EDS, the clinical presentation becomes way more complex. The symptoms, the combination of symptoms become more complex, and the diagnosis becomes more complex. So it's more difficult to, to understand it. You have patients with symptoms coming from, uh, you know, extending from sensory, motor, hormonal, cardiac, gastrointestinal, urinal, so your genital. So the first reaction that the standard pregnant physician is going to have and given a patient like this is going to be this guy is neurotic because every kind of system of the body, uh, he has problems. Uh, other problem is that when compared to the people with Chiari alone, the patient with Chiari and EDS are sicker, much sicker, and they are younger. They tend to be get sicker 10 years in advance with, from the average of the people with carry alone. They, you know, there are six types of EDS. I'm not going to bore you with those, but what are the kinds of EDS we see in this combination? The vast majority are hypermobile, hypermobility type. There is a big chunk of them who are classical type, which is a pain in the neck because with somebody already has with hearing problems, you add the uh, in operation and mix for another issue. Uh, but the problem we have here is the solid ball presentation. The solid ball is somebody who not only has uh, hypermobility, but also has a little bit of spritz of uh, stickler disease, a little bit of spritz of Marfan, a little bit of details of the lowest dits. So the majority, actually, of the people, they do not have a single form, but the solid ball presentation is the most frequent, which is also confusing for people who are EDS experts. Now, another thing of the care in EDS population is that it clusters with a lot of crap, with POTS, dysautonomia, called tether cord, intracranial hypotension, elevated CSI pressure, mast cell activation disorder, hormonal problems, mitochondrial disorders, and when these things unleash, it becomes very, very difficult to um, to manage. 
So the post-op care of this patient becomes enormously complex and it really takes a village. You know, you can have an expert about carrying EDS in the hospital, but if he's by himself uh, in his effort against this disorder and he's not surrounded by nurses which are educated and other, the cardiologist who's educated about it, the, um, the you know, the immunologist, the, the anesthesiologist, at that point you're going to be fighting against the wind. So it took, it took me um, about five years at the, when I was at the Chiari Institute um, to build something good. Now, fortunately, I built something better with more receptive people at my current uh, place at South, South Nassau Community Hospital. So the hospital, unlike the hospital where it was before, is really truly Chiari EDS and mast cell activation disorder friendly at many different layers. What is the complex Chiari, which is what Dr. Brockmeyer was talking about? The complex Chiari is the sum of a Chiari plus problems at the cranial cervical junction. The cranial cervical junction is the limit between the upper part of the cervical spine, which is the neck, and the lower part of the skull, which is exactly where the Chiari takes place. Now, the point is that the concept of complex Chiari sees, defines problems which can be static, or dynamic. So static if they don't move, and dynamic if they do move too much. The dynamic problems can be congenital, for example, EDS, or can be acquired, like trauma or wear and tear, degeneration. The Chiari EDS combo is a part, only a part, of the complex Chiari umbrella. So this is an example. Uh, the posterior fossa is small, the herniation, the, the tonsil should be around here where my cursor is. Instead, they're all the way down here, so there is a massive herniation of the uh, cerebellum. And the odontoid is bent backwards. So there is a retroflex odontoid and a chiari formation, hence a complex chiari. If you just, if you, in addition to this, you also throw the hypermobility of the EDS, you got a major problem. Cervical instability. What are the ingredients? The bones can be defective by shape, so they can be, for example, uh, knotty or abnormally shaped, or can have an abnormal angle among them. Or consistency. They can be too, you know, uh, too soft, like in achondroplasia people or people with extremely um, pronounced osteoporosis. The ligaments can be defective either for genetics linked to EDS or by traumas. You know, if you rip it, the ligaments of a, of a shoulder uh, with a trauma, you can also rip the ligaments to the cranial cervical junction. Then you can have a static component. So everybody has seen the picture of the Lini Tower of Pisa. By the way, I'm Italian and I've never seen it in person, which is bizarre. But uh, if going back to the picture we have here, something which is tilted is less sturdy than something which is straight up and should be in the normal position. If something is born that way, it's not going to be as sturdy as something which is born the other way around. Then there is the dynamic component. A building can be built right and can be built with, uh, you know, good, good devices. But if it is shaky, uh, at that point it can fall down. And the, the hypermobility plays a big role in it. Then there is a concept called reducible and non-reducible odontoid. Just to give you a, an example, imagine that I, many of you have dislocating shoulders. Uh, when the shoulder comes out and then somebody can put put it back in, it's reducible. Some, if a joint, uh, after a while, yeah, cannot be put back in its socket anymore, that's non-reducible. How do we diagnose cranial cervical instability? All right. Measurements are the key. You cannot just have a look and say, oh, you know, I think I have it. No, they're not that way. You have to measure, and you have to measure against uh, ranges, defined ranges. Now, there are more than 20 measurements for the cranial cervical junction, and in the past, um, some of them are about 50, 60 years old. Many of them were designed for trauma. For example, the ADI, which is the atomic density interval, and the power ratio. Why I mention this? Because if you're going to go to uh, Dr. Smith, John Smith from blah, 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 
uh, in Bonneville, these are the only two he's going to know. He's not going to know anyone of all the others that are going to see now. So these are going to be the only two that he has studied in school, especially if he studied more than two or three years ago, and he finished his residency, and doesn't know anything else. So you go to him and you say, I think I have clinical cervical instability. He's going to measure your ADI, which in EDS people does not have a problem, and he's going to sentence there is no clinical cervical instability. He's going to be wrong, um, in, but he's going to be right for what he knows. Now, the other problem is that most of the measurements which are were done in the past were built and were designed in order to define static malformations. Platybasia, basilar invagination. Platybasia is when the angle between the uh, certain aspects of the skull base and the face is too flat. The basilar invagination is when the odontoid, which was the finger-like structure we saw before, is telescoping upward towards the brain. Now, these things are relatively easy to be identified, a little bit more difficult to quantify, but, uh, you know, the neurosurgeon can see them right away. The problem is that most of you do not have a static malformation, but they have dynamic malformation. So how we diagnose cardiac cervical instability nowadays in the modern era? From 20 measurements, we went down to 14 back 10 years ago. And after a big screening, especially done by my good friend, Dr. Nishikawa from Osaka, Japan, we came down to two measurements. Two measurements are the measurements that we use for routine screening. Screening means let's see what you have, but that's not the final sentence. And these two are the PBC2, or grab measurement, and the other one is CXA, or clavo axial angle. Now, many people who have dealt with cranial cervical instability have heard of them. Uh, hardly, you know, not so many people know how to measure it right. I'm not talking about patients, I'm talking about uh, neurosurgeons. Um, the measurements can be used on x-ray for hard measurements. Hard measurements you use just delineate the bone. Or can be used on the MRIs for soft measurements, in which you're including the ligament in your computation. Now, many of you guys go to upright MRIs and you make a big deal out of it. Personally, I hate the damn thing. I'm going to explain you why. The supine MRIs have the best resolution, which means they give you the best picture. Uh, imagine that uh, painting the Mona Lisa with a with a painter brush, but the painter who you know paints the walls of your uh, paints the ceiling of your house. You know, you cannot do something accurate with the big brush. Well, that's what the upright MRIs have. The upright MRIs have very small magnets. Therefore, their ability to give us anatomical details is very coarse. Now, the supine MRIs have the best resolution and can identify the vast majority of cases of cranial cervical instability, even in the patients with EDS, in the majority of cases, just by itself. And just with that picture that you can get anywhere without traveling by, you know, by boat and a donkey to try to find an upright MRI machine. Now, incidentally, the best measurements for accuracy and versatility are obtained on CT myelograms. I'm going to see, um, but the CT myelograms are in basic testing, therefore they should not be done as a screening. Um, now, unfortunately, here, this picture uh, in the translation got lost. And is in, in the uploading from my server to their server, but what I'm going to make myself clear over here. This is a sequence of measurements. One is the PBC2, which is this horizontal line over here, and one is the CXA. If you just incorporate the bone alone, this is so-called the hard measurement. If on the other end you come all the way here, which was the measurement before in the picture which ended up outside of the screen for a technical problem, those are the soft measurements. So the old school neurosurgeons, they never incorporate the, um, the ligament. And it took me a while to, um, to convince the people of the old guard that um, 
using an old standard simply because you're used to bone when the game is moving to the joint and the foot ligaments become important was more it was making more sense and now the um, the final agreement is that everybody is doing soft measurements before the measurements you will do it up here the cxa is going to go from here all the way up here like in the picture before that i cannot show you and the cxa is going to be calculated here so this is a hard measurement some neurosurgeons still do that but the measurement that now is accepted is the soft one now for the reference line reference line has to be done on a t2 picture what's a t2 picture a picture in which the csf is painted in white and you have to go from the inferior part of the clivus to the bottom and posterior part of c2 and then you put a perpendicular line which goes to what is uh, the most posterior part of the pandas which is the black part now what is the problem here the problem here is that on the mri is very difficult to exactly define where the bone ends and where the ligament starts what you see here which is white dish or gray you know light gray is not the entire bone it's just the bone marrow then around the bone marrow there is a part which is a little bit darker which is the cortical layer now here is easy because these borders on the disc and the disc has a different density but the here over here where there is the ligament is very difficult to, uh, to understand where the cortex and when the ligament starts so what is the significance of that the significance of that is uh, if you want to understand how thick the pandas is for future reference it becomes a little bit tricky this, for example, is a CT myelogram. CT myelogram, you know exactly where the bone ends because it ends wherever the white ends, and the ligament starts where the dark gray ends. So this is a perfect picture that you will never get from the MRI. Problem with the supine MRI. Problem, sorry, with the upright MRI. This is a supine MRI. You will never get the picture so clear with an upright. So at that point, you have... Um, problems already define what you have plus uh, multiplied by all the pitfalls of the upright that doesn't mean the upright is not uh, helpful sometimes but we're going to see so stand-up MRI as I said can, is good because can allow flexion extension views that you cannot do on a standard MRI unless you, know, you have some very sophisticated technicians that very early are available but Number one, the pictures have a lower resolution with stand-up MRIs. The motion artifacts are frequent because you are not holding a frame and you're kind of moving a little bit. So very often you have blurred pictures that you cannot really use that well. The main problem is the deflection extension effort. You know, how much you flex is not standardized at all. So you're going to have some technician who tells you to flex a little bit, some of them who tell you to flex the neck forward, others who tell you to uh, touch the chin on the chest, and the others who tell you to the chin away from the chin. They're all flexion, but they are far from being comparable to each other, even in the same patient for different MRIs done over time. And they're often redundant because you can go to a, the effort of finding an upright MRI that in some parts of the country and Europe are not very uh, easy to find when all the diagnosis is already there on the first supine uh, standard uh, common MRI that you had in the first place. Personally, I use them only as an additional test whenever I need, um, you know, whenever I'm not that sure or the data from the supine are not enough. DMX, very often do it. DMX, you go under a fluoroscopic examination, is digital fluoroscopy, which can be uh, recorded now unfortunately there are some problems here as well forget about the flexion extension because these people are more sophisticated about standardizing the flex x you should do but they have normal ranges for normal people we, in jargon we call them the normies EDS are not normal people EDS people are mutants Therefore, you cannot use a normal range like you would never use the normal range for a blood test of a child for an adult 
you cannot uh, use a normal a ruler for a normal person for an EDS person because the EDS person already, even when they do not have clinical problems, they can do fantastic things that the NIST cannot do. All the people in the NIST Olympic gymnastic teams of any country, they're all EDS people. Uh, if you send a normal guy to do the splits, you would just go to the hospital right away. Now, the EDS people, therefore, have their own range of normal. And unfortunately, the, the DMX operators do not have a range for EDS. Now, there are two problems here. One is the kind of cervical instability, and the other one is the cervical instability. The cervical instability is the levels of instability on the levels below C2. And very often I see patients coming with uh, long, um, you know, long uh, interpretations of, oh, there is non-teron which is a slippage of one bone over the other. Um, and, uh, and I say, okay, if it is minimal, I say, all right, so uh, we're going to do a surgery for that? Hell no. We're going to do a surgery only if you fall apart because you're going to be better off treated by reinforcing the muscles around that than not putting screws. There are some people who use bands, and that's a mixed blessing because in order to put the bands, which are reinforcing the ligament, you're ripping the muscles open, and therefore you are kind of maiming the only healthy thing which could help you with your ligaments. So it kind of you end up losing something to get to gain something and you end up being a draw. The other problem is that the DMX is not very helpful with clinical cervical instability and just helpful with uh, what is called subaxial instabilities, which is instability from C2 to C7. Morphometrics. As I said before, CXA and PBC2 or grab oaks or grab are the most user parameters for complex Chiari right now. We already saw the hard and soft values. Now the problem is, if both are positive, in say both of a pathologic is easy, but if only one parameter is positive, which is one is more important. Now, um, there are two main guys in the United States in this field. And one is me, and the other one is Dr. Fraser Henderson. We're very good friends. I started with the EDS first. Um, you be rich afterwards because you, by having been trained in England by Dr. Crocker, he was, he knew very well what craniosurgical instability was. So he, he adopted, he, he just was waiting for the opportunity to find some patients, uh, to, to use the surgery that he learned so well. And the EDS population was very well, and we were pointing at it, and so he became, he jumped into the fray right away. Now, he is a big believer when there is a uh, split result of the CXA over the PPC2 for his reasons. I am a bigger believer for PBC2 over the CXA when there is a split result. Now, these are philosophy. Right now, we're still working on this, and uh, we have our own reasons. That doesn't mean that one is right, one is wrong. But just to tell you, you have the two largest people with the largest experience in the country, and they're disagreeing on something. Okay? So these are still, um, certain things still need to be uh, figured out. Now, another problem is the different diagnostic threshold, thresholds, which are the normal ranges, for adults, and for pediatrics, you cannot, you know, kids are more flexible anyway, even when they do not have EDS, so you cannot use the same parameters as well. Uh, and I'm going back here. This brings one of the controversies which are out there. Many of the people dealing with Chiari in academics, not necessarily in, in normal practice, but in academics, the people who have the loud voices coming from you know, the universities tend to be more pediatric neurosurgeons. While the vast majority of the people who they, they carry patients or in EDS patients are adults. So there is a vocal minority of academicians in who are pedi pediatric neurosurgeons who have their own opinions and they have tended to, you know, kind of push their agendas very often. So one of their points was uh, you know, like you, the, the parameters you guys are using for diffusions, parentheses, in adults, are parameters we would not use in our patient population, parentheses, pediatrics. 
And they say, I hope so, <laughs> because because kids are way more flexible. They, you know, so you cannot use the same threshold for adults to pediatrics. Now, big warning, because whenever there is a new cult, there are people who run all the way to the left. Hypermobility does not mean instability. So the fact that you are hypermobile and you start having some problems in the craniocervical junction does not mean that you are unstable. Um, if you remember the, uh, if you remember from high school, uh, you know, the, you can have, uh, you know, for example, all the, uh, all the black people are men, but not all men are black people. So, you know, that is required because you can have, uh, white people, yellow people, you know, black people, so sort of different things. So you cannot confuse one system with another one. Hypermobility is a larger system. Everybody who's unstable is hypermobile. Not everybody who's hypermobile is unstable. Now, even when you have a pathological measurement, you're going to go in degrees. So it's not that everybody with diabetes are going to jump out of a building tomorrow. Now, the people who have um, mild diabetes and get control with uh, some diet, fine. They're not going to have a rough life. The people who had all their uh, four limbs amputated and they have a heart which is hanging by a thread, Obviously, you know, those guys are not, not going to have the same quality of life. So, same thing here. Pathologic measurements can be graded, mild, moderate, severe. So, if somebody tells you it's not normal, yeah, hello, hold your horses, you know, get things in perspective. Other thing is that pathological measurements do not automatically mean that you're going to get the surgery. As a matter of fact, if somebody made, if the doctor made the, the, the call for surgery on the grounds of pathologic measurements alone, it should not be in this field. Now, the measurements are only one piece of the diagnostic puzzle. So you need at least, you know, for, for a stool to stand, you need three legs. Here in the cases, you need the symptoms, the measurements, and to compromise the quality of life. Now, for the diagnosis of Chiari one more formation, oh, sorry, okay, cervical instability, two big names over here. One was Wendy Smoker from the Medical College of Virginia, who was the first person who really categorized the old school measurements. And she came out with a very important tenet. It takes at least two measurements to characterize the cervical junction. So you cannot just do one and stick to one. You need at least two, two. And I usually make the example of the Flounder. The flounder is a funny fish. If you look in one direction, it looks big. If you look in the other direction, it'll turn it like 90 degrees. It looks very puny. Isao Ishikawa, a good friend of mine, is the chairman of Osaka, Japan, and he spent six years with us, the Kyoto Cervical, sorry, the uh, Kyari Institute. He introduced the morphometrics for Kyari malformation and Kyoto Cervical instability, and he was the responsible for boiling down to two for 20 plus. Uh, he came to us, he spent six years with us, he measured uh, several thousand patients, he generated very important papers that are still quoted now and referenced now for ranges of normal final for Chiari, measurements, morphometrics, and cervical instability. And was important in evolving our concept in visual cervical traction. So, how do we measure, how do we diagnose cranial cervical instability? First of all, you pick the right picture has to be a cervical MRI, not the brain MRI. Why? Because the cervical MRI and the brain MRI, the patient is in a different position with their head because they put the head in a different head hold. It has to do a T2 MRI sequence. So if somebody makes a measurement and the CSF is painted in black and the CSF here is white, they're picking their own one. It has to be a mid-sagittal image. Mid-sagittal image means that it goes from the tip of your nose to the very back of your head in the middle. Grabs measurement, let's go a little bit deeper. It quantifies the mass effect exerted by the tip of the odontoid plus the ligaments around it on the brainstem, which is immediately behind it. Normal is below 6 millimeters. Above 8.5 is pathological. Why there is a question mark? Because this limit is not really living stone. Everybody agrees that more than 9 is messed up. But there are a lot of people 
who are left out in the cold, they could benefit from a surgery who have less than nine. And somebody was using eight at a certain point, 8.5 looks like the new trend is again, is something which has not frozen and has been universally accepted yet. But the agreement is everything above nine is really, really bad. For example, here you see a grab and you see the compression over the brainstem by like this, and this is 8.1. The bone ends here, the ligament is all this black stuff, so you see that the brainstem is getting on the chin by the tonsil herniation behind. You can partially see it because the, the pictures got shifted in the uploading. And uh, getting from the back of the mouth is the odontoid. This is the imagine that I cut your skull uh, along the posterior fossa. So this is the foramen magnum. This is a Chiari malformation decompression, so the bone to bone gets removed. And we're looking down the barrel of the spine where the spinal cord is at. That should be an open, circular, or oval space. But if something pops in, is a problem because things get compressed. And this is the odontoid, which is seen from above, this thing. So obviously you want to put it back. It's like a dislocated bone at that point. This is a interoperative, um, interoperative ultrasound, and this is the junction between the spinal cord and the brainstem, and this is the odontoid down here, and this is the ligament. And as you see that as there is movement with respiration, there is a contact between the anterior part of the um, medulla, the cervical medulla junction, and this ligament. Uh, Clavoaxial angle. It's a different story from the grab. It's not a mass effect, but it's linked to the stress deformity of the brainstem, which gets stretched over the tip of the odontoid, which in turn acts like a fulcrum. It's like you are trying to break a branch from a tree and you use your knees to, you know, it is the fulcrum. Uh, Dr. Henderson, when he was working with uh, Dr. Crocker in his training in England, was the first one describing that there are retraction balls as a pathological finding in the affected brainstem in autopsies when there is a stress deformity. So everything above 145 degrees is normal. Everything at 135 or less is pathological for adults. For kids, it looks like it's a smaller number. Uh, Dr. Um, Brockmeyer very conservatively was suggesting 125 in his first publication. Now he's inching to a higher number. But again, 135 has been pretty much a, uh, a solid border so far, unlike the grab. So here you see an example. This is a soft CXA and a soft grab. The grab here is 10 millimeters, and this is a 123 angle. The angle is between the upper surface of the clivus, which is this, this one, and the posterior aspect of C2, inclusive of the penis. So you understand that 120 compared to the way it should be, which is more than 145, is a big difference. So again, more than 145 is normal, 135 or less is pathological. What does it mean? 135 to 145 is borderline. You are neither meat nor fish. You are neither completely normal nor is pathological. You have something in the middle. And for grab, below 6 is normal. Between 6 and 7.8.4 and is, again, borderline. Uh, this is, again, an interoperative ultrasound to show you how the brainstem at the junction with the spinal cord gets beat up by from the back by the tonsil, from the front by the odontoid surrounded by this humongous ligament. Um, morphometrics, again. Let's break it down some more. The craniocervical junction is a very complex joint and can be the instability, like the joint, can be broken down in three vectors horizontal, rotational, and vertical. In severe cases, all the three components are compromised while in the less severe cases, some are more affected than others, sometimes only one. Now comes the trick. 
CXA and PBC2 are more sensitive to the horizontal instability. Now let's go back one slide. Let's see here. There are three components, and in severe cases, all three components are compromised. So if you are here in a severe case, you got it anyway, because even if these two parameters are more sensitive to horizontal, the, the joint is so messed up that the horizontal is part of the problem. But what if the horizontal is not the biggest problem, I and mean, it comes out kind of borderline, and the patient is sick like a dog? And you have a normal CXA, normal PBC2, you do a flex and extension, that very often these patients cannot really tolerate that well. Sick like a dog, vomiting the MRI, they have to abort some of the pictures. Then you get some pictures marked by a lot of movement articles, still you fall short of something which is very convincing. Is the patient faking it? Hell no. The point is that the vertical instability gets not picked up by CXA and PBC2 when it is the prevalent form of instability. So at that point, you need to get another measurement, which is called the Bezier dense interval, which is a much better parameter to gauge an isolated or prevalent vertical instability. Prevalent is more, more vertical than horizontal and rotational. Bezier dense interval, what is it? Let's go back to the picture, so I'm going to show you. Is the distance between this tip inferior tip of the skull and the superior and closest tip of the odontoid. It can be the bone, cannot be the ligament. Okay? So it's the shortest path between the two. It would be aligned over here. So let's go forward. Um, static BDI, static basic density interval, was identified several years ago. I was a kid in my short trousers in the 60s, and BDI was already up and working. And it was used on x-rays, because there was no CAT scan back then, there was no MRI back then. Static, MD, static BDI is very helpful for what something which is called craniocervical dissociation. So practically, you have a massive motor vehicle accident, something like 80, 90 miles per hour, and your head physically detaches off the neck and it's just hold in place by the skin and muscles. And at that point, the, the distance between those two bones we, we saw before, it can become one centimeter or above. So a static BDI under those circumstances, even just on an X-ray, is going to tell us that the head is no longer connected to the neck, and all the ligaments have failed and been ripped apart. That's an extremely dangerous position to be. Now, dynamic BDI is something which is helpful in EDS because none of you guys have such a catastrophic problem in which the head is physically detached from the neck. It's called internal decapitation because decapitation is when the head rolls away in a basket like on the guillotine in France during the French Revolution. Internal decapitation when is still physically attached, kept together by the skin and the muscles, but the joint is being totally destroyed. Now, the dynamic BDI identifies a component of vertical instability called cranial settling. Cranial settling is something which is settling down. It is like you build, build a house, and uh, the house in the first, if it is made of bricks on foundation, during the course of the first few months is going to settle. And sometimes, you know, big houses can settle by one inch or two in soft ground. So this is the vertical component of craniocervical instability. Now, the BDI requires, dynamic BDI requires standardization, standardized in basic cervical traction and measurements below the millimeter, to the tenth of millimeter. So how do we do it? First of all, we screen people with the axial loading and manual cervical traction. Axial loading means you push the head, you put the patient sitting up, you push the head down, towards the body. And if somebody has vertical instability, they're going to hate it. And then you do manual cervical traction. With your hands, you pull the head of the patient in the sitting position towards the ceiling. And if the patient loves you and wants to marry you, despite, you know, regardless of uh, age, sexual orientation, whatever, you hit the jackpot, most likely you're dealing with vertical instability. Or major instability of when all three are involved and equal. Now, is, does that, is that the end? Hell no. 
At that point, you put the patient to a trial of cervical collar, home traction, and cervical traction with PT. Why? Because you want to verify that that maneuver you did in the office, manual cervical traction, is not a fluke, but is reproducible. Reproducible means that every time it's done, something is going to happen. Like every time you turn the switch on, the light goes on in your room. Why? Because you want to avoid something called placebo effect. The patient is in the office, you know, doctor is so nice, oh my god, I feel so great. But then you're in the comfort of your house, and the same maneuver 20 days later doesn't have the same effect. Placebos does, do not last long. So after all this, what we're going to know? We're going to know that probably the patient has instability. Does it make the uh, surgical candidate? Not yet. There is, in some cases, the Supreme Court test. The Supreme Court test is called invasive cervical traction. Now, this has four major reasons to be. Now, certain people, let's go one step backwards, um, they just are happy of the trial of collar. Now, the trial of collar does not lift your head up. It just immobilizes the neck in the horizontal position. So if you are you have instability mostly horizontal, that's pretty good. But if you have more vertical, the cervical collar is not going to do much. So you could have some false negative. Invasive traction can help in understanding if the odontoid, which is may very often is in a messed up position, is reducible or not reducible. Very important. Because in some cases, if it's not reducible and the odontoid is stuck in a very undesirable position compressing the brainstem, you're going to have to add an additional surgery called transoral odontoidectomy, which is to this day is rare. Not rare for me, but rare for neurosurgery in general. Now, to verify if instability is causing symptoms is also one of the reasons for the inverse traction. Now, you have somebody who um, have an excellent result with a manual traction in the office, goes home, and kind of a, has an uneven track record with the home traction, the tricervical traction with PT. Do we throw the patient away? No. You're in back, you can be having doing the invisible cervical traction. And with that, you can have a more reliable test to verify if the instability is real and if the instability is causing the symptoms. Why? Because sometimes the symptoms you have are EDS related, but they have nothing to do with the cranial cervical instability. At that point, you want to know that before doing a surgery that would be doomed to be unsuccessful to begin with. Another problem is as we said before, to diagnose quantitatively cranial settling. And then also, for people who want a real taste about what the surgery is going to be like, is a dress rehearsal for the corrective surgery. Now, how does it compare to the non-invasive traction? It's not going to be night and day, but there's a big difference. Because very often, people with EDS, you cannot put people in traction too much to, the, to get the sweet spot at which they would have really a good time because the TMJ interferes. And the TM, there is no way for the TMJ not to get involved in a non-invasive traction. This is an invasive traction. How do we do it? We put the patient in sleep. Uh, this is a patient that the patient, this is a patient of mine, but she published it on the Facebook, so now it's public domain, so I can use it. Um, we put the patient asleep with a small injection for five minutes, and then we put two screws on the outer layers of the skull. This thing does not pierce through the skull. Then it's connected to a bar. Up here, there is a rope going upwards to a pulley and then to some weights. We start at 20. We go up to 35 pounds. My good body PA fill uh, is over here. At the same time, we use digital fluoroscopy to get x-ray, and we we get um, a um, quantification in millimeters and degrees of our measure. And this is, a, for example, a, um, a recent patient we did we quite often, and we asked the patient how many how many symptoms of the main symptoms you have uh, generally that are wasting your life. How many you have in today? The 20 pounds. Do they get do the symptoms get better or worse? They stay the same, and by how much? Did it go away? If it go away, it's 100% better. If it's just as medium, it's 10 to 25% better. If 
it is half, 50% there. And then we go 20, 30, 35 pounds, and then we stay at 35 pounds for about 15 minutes. And as you see, there is a progression of the improvement of the symptoms. Now, what does it mean? It means that all these symptoms are have at least a big component of causality in the cranial cervical instability. Translated in English, the cause, cranial cervical instability is the cause or the major cause for these symptoms. Now, what's going to happen? There are certain situations in which the patient comes and three symptoms out of five don't budge but the other symptoms improve. What does it tell us? That those symptoms have nothing to do with the cranial cervical instability. So if the patient has those symptoms uh, at heart, you know, I really care about those three symptoms to improve, you're going to tell them, if you, do the, if you want to do the fusion for that, forget it. But you, you, the symptoms improve are mild and don't, don't care. I don't care about it, so don't do the fusion. Then we can repeat also the morphometrics, but these are going to be dry, hard morphometrics on bone alone, so they do not, cannot fully, they're not parallel to the, to that, so a 2.8 um, or BDI and 5.4 is just a, it's going to be hard bone anyway, there is no ligament between the, in, in bone. But the grab, the grab of 5.2 becoming 3.8, um, on an MRI looks normal. Yeah because there is also the ligament. Here, in this case, uh, the patient was having a 9.5 grab preoperative. Um, and also the CXA without the, without the uh, ligament is on bones alone, because the bones are the only thing you see on the x-rays, is going to be bigger. And then we can also measure things like the uh, dysautonomia parameters in this case. I'm not going to bore you some more on that. Rotational instability is something that many doctors make a big deal out of it. And it, is, uh, it can be visualized with CT, with thin cuts, in reconstruction by measuring the angle between C1 and C2. Because it's a C1, C2 problem. So basically the skull has nothing to do with it. But, number one, EDS subjects, again, cannot be judged using the physiological range defined for normal people. So, all the ranges which are out there, they're for literature from normies. There is no range of normal for EDS to be used. Pediatrics and adults should not be put in the same box together. And remember before there are three um, kinds of instability, vertical, horizontal, and uh, the rotational. The isolated C12 rotational instability is quite rare just by itself. Use a 3D reconstruction of, a, um, of an instability. Now look at here, this is the joint between C2 and C1. And you see that now the joint, the, the facet joints are only um, covering each other 50%. So 50% of this joint is naked in this direction, 50% or no more is naked in this direction. Is this enough? Is not enough? The reality is that the majority of the patients who come to me with uh, severe ADS who benefit from the instability, we don't even have to look at it because their horizontal and or the vertical is so messed up that getting going through the border of doing the rotational CT uh, is just superfluous. But there are some rare cases in which is, um, it is isolated and therefore this test his indication. Complex adults and children. There are differences between these two groups. Complex TRE is more often found in adults than in children. Now, uh, can be this a referral bias because Dr. Henderson and I are um, mostly having adult uh, population. Actually, recently Dr. Henderson is only adult. I do not know, <laughs> but it's going to take a long time for the my pediatric counterparts to reach a patient population comparable to mine. Uh, I'm the guy in the United States with the largest database of carry patients observed and or operated on. Um, we did we did a poll for the last international meeting, and there are only uh, the guy with 
with one guy with more than 1,500 operations, and then my friend Liu. I was with more than 1,300. It was last year, so I, I do not know. Uh, there was one guy with 1,000 who retired, who was, who was already retired by the time of the meeting. And the vast majority of the top international experts had less than 600 cases each. So, uh, and actually the vast majority of the people had less than 300. So as you see, it's a big spread, but not a lot of hands-on experience yet, other than a few, a few people. Now, let's go to the differences. They, there are major anatomical differences. So the deformities, which are the worst, tend to hit the brain earlier. So the, the deformities, which are the most, uh, you know, like, oh, my God, so, those ones so messed up that even a medical student would pick, they're going to be seen earlier by the pediatric neurosurgeons rather than people who are dealing with adults or, or, you know, or older children. Other problem is the pediatric brains can take stretching, pushing, compression much better than adult ones. So it's a, the bounce back and whatever, and sometimes can also be clear the symptoms later. Aging plays a different role in children and adults because aging for a child makes the joint more sturdy. So time is on your side. On the other end, for craniocervical junction problems, in adults, uh, the wear and tear is proportional to the time. So time is not your friend because you're going to have more and more things falling apart with additional big and small and trivial traumas of every day's living. Uh, other thing is the pediatric population, the ligaments keeping the joint together, they get stronger with growth because of hormonal uh, influences which start with uh, puberty. The bones get bigger, they get, you know, they get more sturdier, more solid. So the pediatric craniocervical junction is like a growing tree, which is, in the beginning is very flexible, we get sturdier and, and stronger with time. The adult craniocervical junction, not that way. Everybody who has EDS knows that wear and tear is a bitch. So Degenerative deformities can also affect joints once they start grinding on each other. Uh, acute and chronic traumas they tend to be a role. Uh, people with EDS have a horrible uh, bone metabolism, so there is osteoporosis, vitamin deficiencies in the single digit, which mimics rickets, um, poor bone, uh, bone, bone healing and wound healing. Uh, so you have an adult joint which is more like the hinges of a heavy door that is perfect on day one and then, you know, starts getting downhill after this, but it's never going to be as perfect as the first day that you install it. So what if? Measurements are pathological. You, know, you do the measurements on somebody. They're pathological, but there are no symptoms. Do you fuse it? No. Why? Because there is no role for prophylactic surgery in this field. Now, if it is pathologic, you can have patients with, uh, you know, some some moderately pathologic uh, measurements and very, very sick. Another with measurements which are way, way worse and they are asymptomatic. What's the difference? The difference is that you cannot see the joint in isolation. It has to be seen in the context of everything else which is attached to it. And what is attached to it is the damn brain. So there are some brains which can take a joke and they can take a lot of punishments who are like the princess and the pea and uh, as soon as you touch them, they kind of fall apart and they give you a lot of symptoms. So the fact that there are no symptoms should tell you, okay, this brain is a pro, uh, you can take a punishment, so I'm going to wait until the patient is sick to do something. And Occasionally, you can have somebody who passes through the entire life without anything. It is not very likely. Other scenario, the measurements are pathologic, but the symptoms are coming from something else. I told you before, we do the invasive cervical traction after a series of non-conclusive tests of uh, traction at home. And invasive traction shows that the symptoms are not changing. That means that the instability has nothing to do with it. And the symptoms are coming from something else which is EDS related, and therefore doing a craniocervical instability surgery is not going to get you anywhere. Now, that said, 
if you have no symptoms or little symptoms and you have really messed up measurements, the five-year outlook statistically is not great. Um, at five years from the time of the measurement, from the time of the detection of with mild symptoms, the majority of the people, more than 80% with severely pathological measurements, are going to be operated on. But there is a 20% which are not, who are not getting operated on, then the, hence the um, absence of a knee-jerk reaction for prophylactic surgery. Now, um, EDS, as you know, somebody like bites, is for life. You're stuck with it. So, as you well know, from other joints, you know, dislocate the, the ankle, be a pain there, you don't blame the cranial cervical junction. DDS can give you many other symptoms which are not related to cranial cervical instability. And they are not, like, for example, when you put also factoring his autonomy and parts, uh, EDS has effects which go beyond messing up with your joint. Now, whatever we do only affect that area we're treating, whatever we do surgically, and will not be a cure for the EDS. So, in the case of the EDS, uh, the spine surgeon or neurosurgeon will just be a firefighter. He's not going to be a healer. So, he's going to jump on the problem when, uh, when it's actually happening, Extinguish the fire, go back to the station, and you wait for the next one. Because some of you are going to have multiple surgeries because that's the nature of the beast with EDS. Now, whatever we do, we'll have side effects, which are magnified by the EDS. Next level disease, everybody knows it from having some uh, joints uh, fixed, is of paramount importance over here. Next level disease is you fuse two joints, and the joint above and below now have, are subject to more stress. So in patients, some patients, you can go down and down. You can start short, but then, you know, years later, they fuse half of their spine or two-thirds of their spine by this dominant effect that uh, it starts going. It's not that it's caused by the surgeon, because some, some of these patients with severe um, congenital compromise, they're really kept together with, with spit and rubber band, but there is a pay, uh, there is things attached to surgery. Surgery is never just a uh, unilateral gain with no, uh, no problems attached whatsoever. The axiom that I use for fusions anywhere in the body, uh, anywhere in the spine, for EDS patients is unlike and differently from the people who are not EDS, do it later than you would do for a normal guy, and make it shorter, you would do it for a longer guy. Exactly for the reasons we described. Now, we go to the meat and potato, which are the management of the complex chiari, especially, especially here when the complex chiari is focused on the EDS part. First, 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 conservative management. So you should never jump directly to the surgery, especially if you are uh, debilitated. So conservative management is important because at the very least is going to put the surgeon's soul in peace about the fact that you exhausted that thing and nothing else has worked. And number two, you're going to have the added gain that um, the as, as a byproduct of this, you're going to get in better shape to deal with the surgeries and whatever comes afterwards. Dr. So Muldovny is a uh, world-renowned expert in the field of uh, physical therapy and EDS, so I strongly recommend the Muldovny protocol for whoever has a spine and a cranial cervical junction problem before doing anything. Surgical management is for whoever, number one, has abnormal measurements, number two, has debilitating symptoms which have failed the conservative management, and number three, the quality of life sucks. And to call your life sucks means that you hit the Karnofsky score of 70 or below, which means that your ability to be functional is severely affected. So we do not do surgery for mild symptoms because at that point the risk benefit ratio would not be, uh, would not make sense. As I said before, prophylactic surgery is not indicated. Um, there are several, you know, severely debilitating symptoms 
uh, after the failure of conservative management are necessary as an indication for surgery. You have to have the imaging, you have to have the morphometric, you have to have all the proofs. You cannot just have morphometrics alone. No, no measure itself does not make you a candidate for surgery. Provocative test, I, I assure my philosophy, an urgent versus selective. There are the majority of the patients with cranial cervical instability with Chiari. They are elective candidates, which means that I present them what conservative management could do for them um, at that point versus if they qualify, what surgeon can do for them. But I'm hands off, and that happens the best majority of the time. Then there are some patients who are really, really in deep trouble, and uh, at that point the functional integrity of the brain can get uh, problematic, so that next to stop is going to get a gastrostomy tube or to be intubated or wheelchair at that point, is, I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'm not going to be hands off sooner or later. The mainstay of surgical management for complex Chiari relies on the first two steps, the Chiari decompression surgery and the cranial cervical fusion with odonto reduction. Odonto reduction means that as you pull, as you position the patient, you reduce the odontoid back in the position where it should be. For patients in which that is not possible, you have to add a transoral odontoidectomy. Transoral odontoidectomy means that looks barbaric, but actually is a quite um, simpler operation compared to the other two. You go through them out, you uh, make an opening in the back of the mucosa, which is the wet surface of the back of your mouth, you reach the odontoid, which is here, and you chop all this off. And you decompress this brain stem. And here is not compressed, and here is most of compressed. Um, how many of these I do? Um, obviously, many people with complex chiari go to me uh, rather than somewhere else, so obviously there is a referral bias. Uh, this year alone, I did six already, and it's only April. That is rare. Now, the traditional technique for Chiari and um, EDS causing cranial cervical instability is to give a sizable craniectomy, which means to make a hole in the skull, in the back of the skull over here where the Chiari is sitting. See, while I'm in ectomy, it means that you take a bite of this donut here by opening this vertebra here. And you do, and at that point, many people stop. Or some others do a pericranial duroplasty, which is a patch, or another duroplasty synthetic. And very few shrink the tonsils. I'm not going to go in the specifics of this, but just to give you the taste that there are many ways to do Chiari surgery. They, they're all hitting the same surgical target, which is back here, obviously. And Chiari malformation being a problem of space, all these surgeries are aimed to increase the breathing room uh, in that area. <clears throat> but now all these surgeries are different, and what's different? Some surgeries, the surgeries which are the easiest, are less invasive. Other surgeries are more invasive. The surgeries are, can be done by anybody who doesn't have a lot of experience. The surgeries on the upper side of the southern spectrum should be done by people with a lot of experience. Why are there all these things? Because everybody is going to choose what they want. Not so many people have experience in all the surgeries of the spectrum. I'm an exception because over the course of 20 years of doing Chiari, I've tried them all with large numbers for each one of these steps. So what's the conclusion? Should they be equivalent, considered equivalent? Hell no. The surgery which are the easier have a 65% success rate. The surgery, which are more complex, the top or the, the opposite part of the spectrum, have a 95% plus success rate. So they all help, you know, and there is no surgery which doesn't help unless they're a complication. But um, you understand that they are not back in the same punch. That said, you know, you operate in the air to decompress the car. And to deal with the instability, do a cranial cervical fusion. The cranial cervical fusion is done by fixing the top vertebra of the cervical spine with screws to a what is called a bar plate, which is a bent 
and again, I've under, underlined it for the part bent, uh, piece of titanium, which is adapting itself to the profile of the anatomy of the area in order to keep these things together. Now, this is the anatomy of somebody in the area. You see the back of the skull, and you see the hole of the chiari malformation surgery, and this is the hole of the first vertebra being opened. Great, so you, you put the screws here, screw here, screw some screws in the back, and you put the bar plate. Uh, good, uh, relatively fast. Somebody can do an operation like that in two hours and a half. But what's the catch? The catch is that people with EDS very often, they are very touchy-feely. So having the profile of these things, and if you touch yourself in the back of the head, that's exactly what they're going to be, is very uncomfortable, sometimes painful. So in the 450 plus that I did in my first years, very often the patient was coming back and saying, Doc, my preoperative symptoms feel great, good, but these things, I just want to rip them off from underneath my skin. All right, so you have a patient that is happy for some things, but hates some things that you've given to them. So there was a uh, percentage of these patients who had what is called painful profile. They were having pain from the profile of this. It was very high, and uh, many patients were going to get um, um, blocks, um, you know, local anesthesia blocks, and in the case of several dozen people, we're getting also a neurostimulator. Um, then we start to see other problems later on. Now, one of the things that you see here is that you see the bend. And every time there is a bend, you know from bending things when you were kids, that is something which is already pre-bent is much and long is much easier to be broken than something which is much shorter and straight. So invariably, on large numbers, we had people coming back who were having breakdown. And the breakdown was always happening here, one or both bars being broken here. Not a lot, not alarmingly big numbers, but enough to know this. And then we start to see another thing, something which is called metal fatigue. Metal fatigue is when you play with a um, with a, with a, um, with a paper clip, and after a while you play with a paper clip, the paper clip snaps. If the more you play with it, the more the metal becomes uh, malleable, the more it bends. So here, after a while, even if it's supposed to be immobile, it's not really mobile because there's still forces acting. So after a while, this thing was becoming more flexible, and you're developing more of something called metal fatigue, which is the, the equivalent of having becoming bow-legged when you are very old. And as the metal was bending, the patient was starting losing the initial the initial result uh, to have that. So this is the final result, and then we found the third problem. Anytime you put hardware in the body, it has to be reinforced by bone. And there are different ways to enforce by bone. You can harvest bone by another part of the body and put it there, or add in something, something, cadaveric, whatever. The reality is that no matter how you play, by adding fresh bone, harvesting from the rest of the body or whatever, the ability to cause a bone reinforcement of this kind is more rare, way, way more rare than normal for people with EDS because the, metab the bone metabolism is defective. So over time, and we're talking about several years later, the problems with metal fatigue, not, um, not so much a breakdown, but metal fatigue were becoming more of a problem. So at that point, I start to see some dilemmas. The first one, the carry compression removes bone. Okay, carry cervical fusion likes bone on the other hand. Let's go back here. If I do a carry, and I, will, and I have the bone here, like I had to put the bar somewhere. I cannot put them here because this is the mastoid is full of infection. You cannot put it there. I cannot put put it here in the middle, where, which by where by the way there would be the thickest bone, but the thickest bone is being removed by the carry operation. Other thing is some people with carry surgery they remove bone from here all the way to here and all the way up here. They like a big opening to do their surgery. So. It happens that the two surgeries, they're kind of pulling, is like somebody rowing, but they're pulling oars in different directions. 
uh, they like the same, one wants to remove and one wants to preserve the bones which is in the middle, right? because is the, is the bone which is the thickest. The, 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 the carry surgery removes bone, the cranial cervical fusion ends up preserving and then adding bone. The cranial cervical fusion needs access to thick, and I understand, underline thick occipital areas, and the carry removes the only area which is thick or nearby. So, you understand, like, one surgery very often can shortchange the other in making less optimal it would be by itself. Other problems was, okay, we had two surgeries. Do we do it at the same time or do one first and then the other? And then, you know, opinions about it. My old partner liked to do it um, separate. I love, most of the times I like to do it uh, uh, combined, but with some exceptions. Now, problem. The Chiari patients have thin supraocciput. Supraocciput is the posterior part of the skull. So exactly where you want to put your damn screws, you have very thin skull. Sometimes it's potato chip. So you cannot really do big building with potato chip. Other problems, as we said before, EDS patients have defective bone metabolism. So what are the problems? Defective bone metabolism, number one. Number two, some people, like Dr. Henderson, likes to harvest ribs. Okay, good. People who do not have EDS, when you harvest their rib, they have 15% of complication rate in the heart is inside. You add EDS with all the problems of healing you guys have, and that number becomes much higher. Plus the bone, the pain you're going to have the harvest inside. And then the EDS accelerates the next level of disease, but that's for another problem to go look at. Other problem is the EDS poses more stress on the metal fatigue. I told you before that, you know, that uh, the forces, EDS creates an acceleration to that process. Why? Because all the rest of the joints above and below, and especially below, they move much more than normal. That creates a strain on the metal, which, by the way, is not reinforced by an adequate part of, component of bone, no matter what, because the bone needs to mature and to take, because you guys have a defective bone. Chiari surgery removes the tickets, the thickest parts of the skull, not the ticket. And the Chiari has very thin bone over the accessible occipital. This is an example. Look over here, and this is, this hole here is where the Chiari surgery was done. And you're going to see how thin these things are. I'm going to magnify one. These pictures have shifted. As you see here, there is 1.7 millimeters here. And this was one of the thickest parts of the skull. The long, the shortest screw you can use to anchor the skull to the plate is six millimeters long. And I can tell you, it sucks because six millimeter long is like being hanging off a cliff out of your fingernails. And you had to put not one screw, but you had to put three from three to four on each side. And as you see, the skull changes from part to part, and all the parts that were thick were gone because of the KRD compression. So you understand the very, in many patients with thin cuts, which are actually the majority of patients with carry, they're going to have a problem about where to put the damn screws. So all of a sudden, at the end of all this, at the end of our first stint of Chiari EDS uh, adventures, we realize one thing. We got very accurate in our diagnostic process, but we got not so great with our surgery. Yeah, we were helping people. That's fine. But um, surgeons like my mentor and me, because he broke my soul until I changed like him, we do not grade ourselves on the grades of our successes, but grades ourselves on the grades of our failure, because that's the only way to get better. So we were not really happy about the failures we were having, or suboptimal, not in the strength failures, but also the losing ground on the initial gain. So we came up, I came up with this technique. After years that I was discussing with him, he retired and I put him in action. This is a combination of two techniques, difficult techniques. Don't expect your guy around the corner to do it anytime soon. 
One is called minimally invasive sapiotin selectomy. The other one is a fusion with condylar screws. The first one is abbreviated in MIST, uh, just to make a catchy acronym. I told you before, I, I tried the entire spectrum of operations. Um, each and one has some values. This is not a problem, but uh, I'm going to just go a little bit faster here. What is my role with Chiari, surgeon, Chiari surgery is when there is Chiari alone? I'm like a Chinese menu. I can tell them I can do the easier part, the easy surgery, removing just the skull. I can do the duroplast. I can do tonsillar shrinking. I can do tonsillar resection. Fine. You picked all this. Sometimes some position, some situation, a tonical situation, I tell them, all these are open, but this is the only one that's going to work the best for you. Fine. But here we are with Chiari and EDS, which is a different um, different breed. So for Chiari alone, I tell them, I can do anything you want. But if you ask me, like every cook, I have my favorite dish. Now, this is the first publication regarding this. It was a joint between me and my friend in Beijing. You remember the guy with more than 1,500 surgeries. And this is the emblem of his center and his hospital. Obviously, since I like to travel, Every now and then I went to see him as an exchange to him traveling to see me. So we are friends, we've been friends for 11 years now. And uh, I stole the surgery from him. And then I adapted it, adapted to what was my uh, skill set. And now we have two versions of the MIST. The MIST Operation Beijing style and the MIST Operation New York style. Some differences, blah, blah, blah. These are the building uh, so, just smaller craniectomy needed. So at that point, you leave more bone for the fusion. The C1 can be just spared. So you don't have to open it up. Uh, instead of making a wide incision, you make just a linear dural incision. And uh, instead of Y-shaped, which is much more comfortable for the surgeon. And then instead of just... Um, not touching the tonsils or touching them just a little bit with the bipolar, which is practically burning just a little small section, uh, what we do is we chop them off. We chop off between two-thirds and 50% and two-thirds of the tonsil part. And this is all the rest, and then we close. And this is an example about how it is done. The incision is only two inches long, sometimes two inches and a half. Small bone opening. Below the bone, there is the dura, which is sort of the membrane covering the brain. We check with the ultrasound where the tonsil is at. We make the incision just over the tonsils, one on the right, one on the left, and then we start burning them. As soon as we burn them, they kind of start shrinking a little bit, but not by much. At the end of all the burning, you see they're not, they're still approximately in the same place. Then we slice them open and we repeat the process inside. We burn the inside because the inside stayed medium rare, like a big steak. And then we chop all the dead tissue off. Now, before somebody passes out, uh, the ton cerebellar tonsils have no function whatsoever, especially when they're needed. So you know, we're chopping a part of brain which has no function. It's like removing the appendix helps you, but does not. Uh, pose a threat to your health. Oops, sorry. And then after all that, we close and we're done. Um, here are some statistics just to show you that my colleague at that point, when we uh, published the paper two years ago, had already done almost 1,500 and he passed it, and I done 180. I'm already 250 plus now. And this is the incident of complication. Now, one of the problems for these very enormous things, uh, you know, very aggressive surgeries are, you know, just like, take a lot of risk there, how dangerous it is. And this is the stat. He has only 1.4% chances of complications out of all these major items, which are here, which are from strokes to meningitis, etc. And I, I got lucky up to that point, so I was zero. Yeah. But, you know, he had done uh, almost 10 times mine. So. Pros and cons, 
this technique is definitely more demanding, longer learning curve. Um, since you make an incision so small and so linear, you just reach under the hood, and uh, you have to keep bear in mind variants of an artery passing by. The pros is that is a is a hood to close the dura because the dura in the middle end is very thick, uh, and you, so far I had zero leaks into 150, which is unheard of in KRA. Uh, tonsil reduction is very important to announce because practically you chop it off up to 60% uh, of it. Therefore, I'm in the the 11 kind of nerve of fully decompressed, which are targets for KRA decompression. All right. So what are the advantages for the KRA EDS combo? We do not remove a lot of skull. C1 gets left intact if this option is needed. And the C1 is going to be fused afterwards anyway. And uh, we are prevented from going back later to do more Chiaris. Because what it stinks for Chiari EDS is that if you do not decompress enough Chiari and you fuse them, then going back in and finishing the job of the Chiari is extremely difficult, even for people who have been around the block like me. So you're better off doing the best bunch the first time rather than having a nightmare scenario going back the second time with the patient fused. But the, patient, the fusion is going to interfere with your surgical approach. Now, this is a classic example, same patient, before and after. This is the aviation, this is after. And you see here the difference is that all this part of tonsil has been chopped off. And the brain stem is very expanded. Second stage is the fusion. Instead of using the bar plate, we use condylar screws, and there is short, straight bars combined with fusion of C1 and C2. Let's go. This is a skull upside down. Look at this white stuff here. These are called the condyles. The condyles are the, one of the most thickest part of the, the skull. And they are the pillars on which the skull is setting on the way to C1, the first vertebrae. So how convenient is just in the center of things. And look how thick it is. So in, and this is how thick should be the back of the skull in normal people. Normal people, uh, usually when you open the posterior fossa, which is this area of the skull, you get calluses. Uh, I have some Chiari patients that they, the skull was so thin that they flicked it like you would have flicked, you know, a, a potato chip off your table. All right, so what's the advantage? Instead of a six millimeter screw, you can put very long screws inside these big things. So there is no part of the skull of anybody who you can put an 18 millimeter screw for fixation, and this is the base of the skull. So we have some safeties, I'm gonna grease on it. And this is the way it looks at the end. You have the first vertebra, second vertebra with the screws in it, and as you see, the base of the skull, instead of being fused all the way above the picture where you don't see it, the skull base is here, which is very, very close to each other. And then after you add the bar, you only have a very short bar. So instead of something which you would look long, long about uh, six, uh, between six and seven inches and bent in the middle, here you have something which is one inch and a quarter thicker and straight. So these are two, you understand immediately how this thing will never bend. It will never be affected by metal fatigue. Another thing which is interesting is that while the screws in the old configuration in the skull were here, here the screws in the skull is very close to the other and is parallel. And there is something about having screws oriented in the same direction. There is a balance in the biomechanics of the construct. Now, this is the way that the joint is. This is the condyle, first vertebra, second vertebra. And you see how, you know, how the things are. And this is after we fuse. Now, this comes to the beauty of this. In the old fusion, the old fusion was extending way above here with a, with a uh, bent bar. And we were having good fusions here between two, one, two, and sometimes lower down, but we were always struggling to get fused here and all the way, and we were practically finding nothing in the upper parts of the bar. 
So the part of the body which was bent was invariably naked and therefore exposed to mechanical stress. Here, instead, we have a very short bar which is entirely in, encompassing, encompassed by diffusion. What you see here, this rectangle that I'm um, doing now, is not the original bone. This is bone which has taken with the bone fusion and is extending inside the joint. So it's a very compact fusion. As you can see here, this is a regular bone and this is the bone fusion reinforcing the hardware, just exactly where you need it, without anything which is bothering you in the back of the skull, nothing reaching here where the skull would be in with a um, puny short screw that could pull out or whatever. Everything is sturdy and tucked, and tucked back underneath. And you see here that I did the reduction of the odontoid. Now, if you have a situation in which the odontoid cannot be reduced during the surgery, you're going to have through the mouth, go through the mouth and chop it off with a transoral. Not very frequent. So fortunately, people with DDS, this is one of the circumstances in which DDS plays to their advantage. Because DDS allows the joint to be so movable, they can actually move it back in its normal position and fix it there. So what are the con pros and cons? Technically, it's way more demanding. It's slower. A longer learning curve. Um, many patients with carry have hypoplastic condyles, which means the condyles are so small that you can barely have one trajectory for one screw. And uh, therefore, it's very tricky to get the screw in this. So far, uh, I was able to put screws in all the patients I tried to. 10-12 um, cranial nerve is a, is a problem, but uh, from, described from the first guy who ever did it in 2009, I started in 2011. Now, so far, I have done more than 500 screws with only two events, which uh, both result in full recovery of the 12 cranial nerve. So, at the bottom end, um, at the bottom end is 500 plus screws, two temporary events, no permanent events. The pros is that the hardware profile is minimal. The comfort, the comfort of the patients is, cannot be compared to the other ones. How do I know it? Because I had patients who had failed with the old fusion and they bought themselves the new fusion. So they were the first one telling me, the hardware profile doesn't bother me anymore. I feel more sturdy, hence the better my mechanics. I know already from my part that there are far less failures and a better bone fusion in the position. And in none of the cases, I had to compromise the sort of occipital decompression of the carry for the fusion because as far as I'm concerned, you can have a patient with no skull whatsoever in the back of the skull and I can still put screws in the condyles anyway because there is no condyle or no carry surgery which is going to remove the condyles. And so far, I had way, I tried all these things. I had better clinical results with the mist for the carry and better clinical results with this procedure, even if they are difficult and more long to be done for me. It takes me double the time to do the same surgery. To give you an idea about how sturdy they are, the patients in the past who were having that bent old-style bar plate, uh, very often when they were having minimal fender benders at 30 miles per hour, they were breaking the hardware. Now, I already had three patients who totaled the car. This was a car was going out in the, the far west, um, 80 plus miles per hour, and they went off the road after hitting an uh, ice patch and uh, tumbled three times totaling the car. The patient had the cranial cervical instability with a condyle screw. It, they, it, it uh, stayed sturdy, did not break, did not bend. The screws did not pull, with the way it looked also from the other side. There's not a situation. Here there were two patients in the car on my One with the old fusion and one with the new fusion. The car was totaled by a incoming enormous truck, one of those that are so popular in Texas. And the car was totaled and was, uh, and the two patients were inside. Which were pediatric, were not so far uh, different in age from each other. The old style fusion broke, both parts, bar plates snap. The new fusion, despite the fact that it was younger, it was still, the bone was still maturing, 
um, resisted the impact and nothing happened. Um, so what are the take home messages from tonight? Chiari and EDS often come together and now the top experts are agreeing with that. We do not know how many, what the percentage in my practice is about, uh, you know, in the past, my partner, we estimated the combination was about 16%, but then with more, you know, uh, more and more patients coming and the similar patients coming, the referral bias on that number is no longer uh, reliable and is much higher. The clinical presentation in these patients is way more complex. The patients are way sicker. And the combination of these things together, the Chiari and EDS, make more difficult both the diagnosis and uh, which cannot be just a knee-jerk reaction, you have something abnormal with fusio, and the treatment. The treatment, as you see, has a lot of moving parts. So, um, I thank all of you, and I'm going to go back to the second slide. Uh, I already kept you so far for uh, two hours, and as you see, I, I skipped also a couple of slides to, to make it on time. So, for non-clinical, scientific questions on theory, on theories about generic which are not involved in your case, you can email me directly at that email. I cannot answer to you regarding by email to personal clinical questions, but if you are interested to uh, have a consultation, I will going to be more than uh, more than more than happy to do so. Um, you send me an email. You say, you know, I want a consultation. I'm going to send you a um, I'm going to send you the information about what to do for it. Um, for people who are going to you know, uh, live in a way, we offer video consultations, usually at about something variable between 30 minutes and 60 minutes. Uh, they are far lower than going rate, and below you can see our website. So I hope that um, I, the take-home messages that you've seen at the end they are deeply drilled in your brain, but I also want to give another message. Do not play doctor. So it's good for a patient to be um, to be uh, informed about their own disorder, especially about disorders which are tricky and they get um, you know, they, you don't find very often people who can understand it. So you, you feel that you have to defend yourself. But keep it like that. Use your knowledge that you accumulate from you know, seeing this in the sky to get to the proper doctor and land him there. But then let him do the job. Don't play doctor. There is a reason why not everybody goes to medical school and just the minority of people go to medical school go to neurosurgery. Um, it takes it takes just much more than just two concepts glued together that you hear three or four times and you think you're an expert. Even for and for that. So do not play doctor on each other. Uh, this information is just for you to understand how complex the thing is and to understand how things should not be done. And it is good. But don't go beyond that because you're going to go, you're going to get hurt. And, uh, you know, about the rest, things are going to sort themselves out. You know, as, as I saw, I showed you before, it took 12 years for our top colleagues in the field of Chiari is to understand and accept that there is a Chiari and EDS combination. It's going to take much more time for the other neurosurgeons and the other people who are primary care physicians to even hear about. It. So don't be impatient and just go. You have the advantage of groups like this which expose you to people and, uh, and knowledge. So use that knowledge as a tool, not to a means to an end. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you very much to John and his daughter for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Bolognese. Um, the live attendees are so appreciative for all of the um, information that you've provided tonight. And uh, everyone is just uh, 
really thankful and glad that you spent so much time. I know two hours is a long time to talk, so we really appreciate that, that you were so thorough and so giving of your time and um, all of your experience that you've had with this. Um, and um, we wanted to remind everyone that um, this recording will be posted so you can go back and uh, look, listen to information that you might have missed or um, something that you want to focus on if you want to uh, look at a particular slide for a longer period of time. There's a, a separate file that will be posted there for you to flip through and look at the slides that he provided for you tonight. Um, so again, um, just a very warm thank you and we appreciate everything that you've done and all the uh, compassion that you've had for our patient community is, is very apparent um, through everything you've done. So so just warm thank you from everyone because everyone's real appreciative. You're welcome. Good night. <laughs> Good night, everyone. And again, thank you for attending and we'll have our next webinar um, coming up next month, so um, look at our website for the uh, announcement, and you can sign up to receive those email announcements automatically if you'd like by going to edsawareness.com or chronicpainpartners.com site and clicking on the uh, free guide, which gives you some information about uh, different programs we have and also uh, signs you up for that email list. Um, we don't send very many emails out. They're just uh, just for information to help you a um, couple times a month. So um, please do that, and we look forward to joining you next time uh, when we meet next month. Have a good night, everyone.